The question really arises around the use of metformin mm -hmm. and whether or not there's sort of a true impairment of mitochondrial function or whether the elevated lactate levels we see in patients taking metformin is an artifact of the drug itself, but says nothing of the mitochondrial function. Do you have any more insight into this question that, that, that we struggle with greatly because yeah. we have some patients who take metformin who achieve... Uh, who, who receive much benefit from taking metformin, but it makes it confusing to interpret their zone two data. And it makes me ask the question, sh you know, it's a more important, in those patients, it's maybe less relevant, but now it becomes relevant when we think about using metformin as a geroprotective agent, an agent to enhance longevity. Yeah, I, that's a thing that um, we need a lot, a lot of, uh, um, um, research on that, I think, to understand this better. Now, we, it's, it's a strange that it definitely it seems to work in many patients, right? Obviously, for those ones in the pre-diabetic, first-stage diabetes, uh, is the, it's a very good uh, medication. It's been used for, for a long time and with good results. But how about the long-term the long -term results, right? Um, we know that uh, metformin inhibits complex one, which is key for mitochondrial function in the electron, electron transport chain. Um, so we don't know the long-term effects of metformin, right, um, uh, in longevity. This is where I think that we need more, more, more information as well. Uh, we see, uh, or I see, like someone showing up with a uh, lactate of 3.5 millimoles at rest. And the first thing I ask is like, are you on metformin? And many times say yes. And I'm sure you see the same thing, right? And like, wow. So, um, so it's, it's definitely... An artifact, and why do you see at rest 3.5 millimoles or 3 millimoles of lactate? And, and by the way, is there fat oxidation commensurately suppressed? Because when you when you metabolically uh, test them on the cart, do you see in that individual a very very low fat oxidation? If if not, it might suggest that 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 lactate level of two or three millimole is is an artifact, but doesn't yes. really speak to what's happening in the mitochondria, right? And that's a great question. I, mean, I haven't seen people taking metformin as a, a um, 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 uh, um, um, medication, you know, for longevity, for example, or for health. What I see people on metformin are already clinical patients. Yeah. So, so in other words, it's confound. So, of course, they're low because yeah. yeah. So they're taking metformin in the first place because of their clinical condition, which is driven by a mitochondrial impairment or dysfunction. So it's, it's difficult to discern, but I mean, I'm sure you, 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 you have more experience of people taking metformin. We do, are, but, but um, yeah, but yeah. that's why this study that we're eventually yeah. going to get around to doing is going to be so important because it will answer this question directly. Yeah. And, and we can do the muscle biopsies. And as you say, it's like, it, 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 does it really mess up with the whole mitochondrial function or can even like uh, the mitochondrial function overall override that inhibition of complex one? And, and overwrite other pathways. I, I, I don't think we know the answer to that. Do you have an insight into any other uh, supplements? There's a, no no shortage of of supplements that are out there that that are touted as sort of you know longevity boosting agents and mitochondrial health agents. So so the most talked about of all of these, I think, is the precursors to NAD. So the most common of these would be NR uh, mm -hmm. or NMN. Yeah. Both of which are uh, pretty clear that they are precursors to NAD. There's certainly some debate about how clinically relevant it is. Do you have a point of view on whether or not taking a supplement that boosts uh, NAD at least in the plasma? I don't. I still don't know how well it's boosting NAD in the cell. But yeah. um, nevertheless, do you, do you have a sense of if that is beneficial to the mitochondria? Um, both theoretically, but more importantly, experimentally. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's a great point. And this is like, I, I don't think we have the answer, but I think we need to be cautious about how we we interpret this data. Um, um, it's definitely been shown multiple times that um, NAD levels and at the cellular level are, and even mitochondrial level are decreased with aging, right? Therefore, the whole thing, whoa, if it's low, let's take it, right? But it's not only NAD. Um, I mean, if you look at so many metabolites, you know, in at the cellular level and mitochondrial level, they're downregulated with aging, right? The question is, why are they, they are they downregulated? Uh, is is because mitochondria 
per se to start out with is downregulated. So it doesn't need so much NAD because it cannot take it, right? Or other supplements or other metabolites, right? So this is this is at least how I think of um, um, NAD. It's as, as we mentioned earlier, it's very important in glycolysis. It's uh, in redox st status, right? To maintain redox. And it's very important in the uh, in 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 uh, glycerol 3 phosphate to 2 3 biphosphoglycerate phosphate, where NAD is utilized. Uh, to convert um, uh, glycerol 3 phosphate to 2,3 phosphoglycerate, uh, but it's depleted. And this is what the only thing that rescues that is lactate, right? As we mentioned. Now, taking NAD, is that going to increase longevity? I don't think so. That's my opinion, because longevity is not just one supplement or two or three or four or five. It's a compendium on, on an incredible amount of things that happen at the cellular level. And I don't think that one supplement. I remember those days where resveratrol was the thing, right, for longevity. And everybody was, not everybody, a lot of people were buying resveratrol and there are studies with mice showing that increased 50% longevity in mice, so therefore they're doing humans. Well, as you probably know, a lot of people started taking resveratrol when they were 50 and they're dead now. You know, uh, it didn't increase, it doesn't increase longevity in humans, right? Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, I think the data in the in the mice, we can, debate the merits of that. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about a theoretical risk though. You, yeah. you kind of alluded to it. Isn't there a scenario under which too much NAD could be harmful? If you had an existing, if you took, I don't know if this study has been done, but if you took cancer mm -hmm. patients or patients who had tumors that were undiagnosed and gave them, if you boost, if you doubled their NAD levels, wouldn't you actually favor the tumor's metabolism? Well, in fact, we have done that pilot study with mice. Um, so the whole thing is like looking at, and my area of research in cancer is cancer metabolism, right? Yeah. And we know that glycolysis is key for, for cancer. Uh, and, and NAD is absolutely indispensable to feed that glycolysis, as, I meant, as we have mentioned, alluded a few times, right? So the question is like, as you said, would, would NAD increase that glycolytic rate or glycolytic flux, therefore would be favoring more a, a, a cancer phenotype. Uh, um, so what we did, uh, we haven't published that, it's a pilot study, which is, we're curious about it. And we had a few mice, we have uh, an N of eight mice, four and four. So what we did is we transfected um, uh, tumors. We have uh, triple negative breast cancer, it's very aggressive and it grows very, very fast. And uh, um, uh, so one group, uh, uh, we give them just water. And the other group, uh, we give them a, a nico a nicotinamide uh, uh, ribocyte, which is the NAD precursor. Because NAD, obviously, as you know, you cannot take it. You need to take the precursor. And we observe the tumor growth over 23 days. Um, after that, the IRB at the university, um, because you cannot have animals uh, with, with, uh, with high tumors, right? So it was a flank tumor and you need to um, uh, harvest them. So uh, after, and we were measuring, you know, uh, every five days, the tumor growth. And we saw in these animals uh, um, that there was about 15% increase in tumor growth in the NAD group. So uh, again, I- And, I, and you, you saw that difference with only four mice in each group? Yes, it's four and four, but, but, but all consistent. You know, we had statistical significance, even with the small four. I mean, there was no cross results. All the four mice, they grew cancer uh, at a higher rate than uh, in the NAD, than the control group. Again, that's where like, obviously this is not like a publishable uh, because yeah. we need a more- Is, is that uh, a study you, you, you'll, you'll repeat at, at a sufficiently powered uh, size? I would love to. And this, this is why we just did this pilot study. We had, because we have many mice and say, hey, let's, let's, let's give it a shot. And let's see, because there's a lot of hype of NAD and, 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 and we saw this. So we would love to, to, to do it at a much higher level because my question, which might be a, a disruptive question is like, as you know, what if you have a, a small tumor that you're unaware of, like in the pancreas or in the colon or in the lung? Could NAD over time, day after day after day, could favor that 
glycolytic flux to that tumor and, and, and increase the growth. In the literature, I'm, I've never looked because it just kind of occurred to me when you had that slide up earlier, right, earlier when you showed the mitochondrial slide, um, yeah. it occurred to me that there you have that lactate escape from the tumor, mm -hmm. hey, this would feed it. But has anybody in the literature examined this question? It seems like a very common, I mean, it seems like a, a, a reasonable question to ask. Yeah, I, there are a couple of studies, um, I think once in a review, uh, it, it's more at the conceptual level, right? And this is what got me thinking like, yeah, this is, this is something that for us working in cancer metabolism, we look into this, right? Uh, um, looking at, you know, like obviously, and one of the things that we have shown is that lactate is an oncometabolite. Lactate, it, uh, uh, we have shown, uh, we have a first paper and we have like a, like a good six, seven papers more to come. Uh, we, we've been working hard for three years looking into this, but we saw that lactate regulates the, um, um, ge the genetic expression of the most important genes in breast cancer. We're, we're seeing the same thing now with lung cancer. Uh, uh, and lactate, as we keep talking about this, is the, is the mandatory byproduct of glycolysis. And, and as Warburg saw in 1923, uh, the characteristic of cancer cells, or most cancer cells, is the high glycolytic flux. But what struck Warburg was not the glucose itself, was the lactate production. Um, so anyways, we, we are showing that it's an oncometabolite. So if you, if you have a high glycolytic rate in a cell, you're going to produce a lot of lactate. Right. Uh, if you cannot clear that lactate, it's going to drive cell growth and proliferation as we're seeing. And in fact, we're now um, uh, blocking lactate production, both through genetic engineering as well as DCA, for example. And we're seeing that uh, cancer uh, growth and proliferation completely stops within hours. So uh, again, now that poses an interesting dilemma, right? Which is yeah. exercise would increase your capacity for clearing lactate in the long term, but in the short term raises lactate. So it begs the question in a cancer patient specifically, what's the net impact of exercise? Yeah. So, uh, this is what we're working on that, that the hypothesis, you know, with my colleague, George Brooks. Um, so he's shown that acute response to lactate, uh, it increases, uh, overexpression, um, uh, about 600 and something genes, I forgot right now, right? All these genes are involved in cellular homeostasis and in the benefits of exercise, right? So we know very, very well through his work that lactate is a signaling molecule. Now, the question is like, we, we know this at an acute exposure, which is exercise. You do exercise, boom, 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 you're out. But cancer uh, 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 doesn't do that. Cancer accumulates lactate and it keeps accumulating. And this, this is the main responsible for the uh, um, um, tumor microenvironment, which is acidic. And the more acidic the tumor microenvironment, the more metastatic the cancer is and the more aggressive, like the more glycolytic the tumor is. And this is very well documented. The more glycolytic the tumor is, the more aggressive it is. And the more lactogenic, that is more lactate, uh, the tumor produces, the more aggressive it is. Now, why is that lactate accumulating, right? That's what we need to try to find out. But we know that that, 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 that is not acute anymore. It's chronic exposure to lactate. Um, so can exercise counteract that, right? Um, uh, when we see that exercise might be beneficial for many patients, but again, going back to the right intensity, uh, we know the, um, the particles, which are exosomes, right? They're micro vesicles in the body they're main responsible for metastasis. We have seen that, uh, and this is another publication we want to have in, in, in breast cancer cells and lung cancer cells. Uh, we are looking at the protein content and the microRNAs of those exosomes released by these cancer cells. And it's incredible the information that they have there. Uh, if you were to genetically engineer uh, um, a molecule, they can be um, um, uh, you know, injected into a tissue and transform into cancer, you would replicate an exosome. It has all the components needed. On the, on the other side, muscles also release exosomes. And this is, could be one of the, why the, the benefits of exercise as an organ, you know, in the crosstalk between skeletal muscle and many, many organs. Uh, we know that if you have um, um, a very good um, 
muscle health, right? Your health overall, your metabolic health is going to be good. Could you be releasing great exosomes? They're very uh, pro-oxidative, uh, which counteract the glycolytic phenotype of cancer. And could those exosomes travel directly to the cancer cells and, uh, and counteract that and penetrate into, inside the cancer cells and transform the glycolytic phenotype of the cancer cells into more oxidative phenotype and keep cancer at bay? We don't know yet, but we're, we're suspecting that uh, we're scratching the surface of something that potentially could be a very interesting thing to understand better the effects of exercise as well as neuro 